Good evening, and welcome to our midweek Bible study with Freedom Baptist Church. You probably haven't seen me in a while. If you haven't figured it out, I'm not in Virginia anymore. I'm, um, I'm actually in West Virginia at Appalachian Bible College right now, and this has been quite the semester. It's been a whirlwind of, of a semester with um, just COVID regulations and keeping up with classes and working to um, being on some more singing groups again. Um, but it is good to be back with you, if not in person, in video, and you guys thought you had gotten rid of me, but I'm sorry, you didn't. I'm back. I'm back um, for this 30 minute or so video on um, Psalm 34. We'll be talking about Psalm 34 tonight, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to this psalm, Psalm 34. And um, as this semester has been a good semester at ABC. It's also been um, somewhat of a of a difficult semester, of a tense semester. Um, this psalm has been a psalm I've kept coming back to. I, I read it near the beginning of the semester and it, it's been just sticking with me and it, it's a good reminder just, uh, and I hope I can remind you, um, I, I've titled this psalm, A Prayer of Deliverance and Delight. So it's going to remind us of God's character and um, what he can do in our lives, and then hopefully it will inspire us to delight and, and rejoice and praise God together. So Psalm 34, if you look in your Bibles, I'll, I'll read the psalm title for us together. Hopefully your Bible has the psalm title in it. Um, this says, A psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So I'll stop right there. Um, first, I think it's important for us to understand the background of this psalm. And the psalm titles are important. They, they really help us understand the psalms better. I actually, um, in one of my seminary classes over the summer, I ended up writing a paper on the psalm titles. Um, but one of the things I, I learned just from researching them, the psalm titles are in the original Hebrew Hebrew manuscripts, and a, a lot of modern English Bibles might not have the psalm titles in them, but they're important. I think they should be included, and, and they give us a lot of clues. Um, for this psalm, it, it tells us the historical background, the, the circumstances behind it, and I think that's important for us to consider. So turn over in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 21 verses 10 to 15. David wrote this psalm at a particular time in his life. And we know that most of the psalms have arisen at, at particular times through individual circumstances in the lives of the psalm writers. And any time we can know that these circumstances and what they were helps us understand the psalm better. So 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 to 15. Remember, the psalm title says, a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. Well, when did this happen? It happened right here in 1 Samuel 21. So starting in verse 10, the Bible says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is this not David, the king of the, the, king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish the king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and fiend himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down on his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen? that he have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. So that's the background of this psalm, right? David goes to Gath. I think it's ironic that, that just before this, we see that David goes to Nob, to Abimelech the priest. And he's like, okay, Abimelech, help me out. I need, I need a sword. And Abimelech's like, well, the only sword we have here 
um, this is actually in, in chapter 21, verse 9. Um, he says, the only sword we have here is the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. The guy, the guy you killed. Um, with that sling, that, like, that was pretty impressive. The guy, the guy you, that you threw the rock at and killed. We, ha we have his sword. And David says, oh, there's, there's none other like it. Like, give it to me. Just, I need a sword. Goliath's sword will do. It's a big sword. Let me have it. The thing is, Goliath was from Gath. We know that from other passages in, in the scripture. Goliath came from Gath. And right after David gets the sword of Goliath of Gath, he goes to Gath. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's probably the same thing I'm thinking. Like, David... What are you thinking? Like, why would David do this? Why would David get the, the sword of, of Goliath and go to Gath? The only explanation I can think of is probably David wasn't really thinking through this. I mean, you think David's going to go into Gath with Goliath's sword strapped on his side and they're not going to recognize him? Uh, and, and maybe David thought he could sneak in there without them noticing. But they noticed pretty soon. And the servants of Achish, they're like, Wait, like, this is David. Like, don't you remember, like, how many songs people would sing about him? This is David, the one who who has killed our people before, and he's probably going to do it again. Like, you better watch out for this guy. And David realizes he's there, he's outnumbered. This is not a good situation for David. And what does he do? Well, he just pretends to be a madman. He pretends to be crazy. Um, has some type of mental illness. Something is wrong with David here. And he lets his spit fall down onto his beard, starts just writing random things on the wall. Um, this was probably a, a last-ditch effort for David. He realized, okay, this is bad. What do I do now? Um, let's see. I'll uh, pretend to be crazy. That's it. Yeah, I'll pretend to be crazy. And David does it, and somehow it works. The, the king's like, you know... I don't need madmen around here. This David guy, like, okay, maybe he was a great soldier once, but, like, he's obviously crazy now. Just send him away. And basically what this is for David is a narrow escape. So 22 verse 1 says, David therefore departed and escaped. He escaped from this dangerous situation. I mean, David easily could have had his life taken here. So this psalm is written in a response to these circumstances. And look at what David, you can turn back over to Psalm 34. Look at what David says in verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. In verse 2, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Who magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So the basic structure of this psalm, it can be broken down into two parts. So verses 1 to 10 are David's testimony. And then 11 to 22 is David's teaching. So verses 1 to 10, what God did in David's life. And then verses 11 to 12 are what he wants God to do in his hearers' lives. But in his first part, it's, it's a call to the reader to magnify the Lord with me. He, he wants to praise God for what God has done in his life. I think the phrase, with me, or exalt his name, together, that, I think that's important. And there's something, there's something about worshiping the Lord together. Right? David was delivered here, and he could have just thanked God by himself. He could have just, on his way back, escaping, going to the, the cave after he, he went away from Gath. He could have just prayed to God in the cave all by himself. He could have gone in the woods somewhere and had his quiet time, sang to God, praised him. Why not just sing the song all on your own, David? But David didn't write the song just to sing all on his own. David wrote the song for corporate worship. He says, magnify the Lord with me. There's something about praising God with other believers. There's something about singing with other believers. I mean, I, I realized this when, when COVID happened and church was canceled. There's something really special just about singing with God's people. And I can remember sitting there on, on my couch watching our, our live um, services, and I remember thinking, you know, 
singing in your living room, you can relate to this, I'm sure, singing in your living room is not the same experience as singing in a church. And like, no offense, Pastor Bill, you have a great voice, but it's just not the same listening to you sing on, on a um, Sunday school service that's videotaped as singing with the whole body of believers in a church service. There's something about singing to the Lord together. There's something about exalting his name together. There's something about magnifying the Lord with me. And David realizes this. David calls the reader to magnify the Lord with him. Do we praise God together? When, when God does something good for us, when he delivers us, is our response to be, oh, that's good, you know, just keep that to myself. Thank you, Lord. Or is it be to praise God for what he has done in our lives, to praise him in front of others? That's the biblical pattern, according to this song. Look at, look at verses 4 to 7. This talks about the Lord's deliverance. So verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. So this is a reminder of how God delivered David. Right? He says, David's describing his experience. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. So I can picture David. He's in Gath. He realizes, you know, this was not a very smart move, walking into Gath with the sword of Goliath of Gath strapped on his side. Like, this was not a smart move. And David realizes this, and it, it says, I sought the Lord. So I can, I can picture of him when he realizes, you know, I goofed right now. Lord, deliver me. I, I can picture that prayer uh, in that moment. And David says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me. And he delivered me from all my fears. And then he says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. So if you remember the angel of the Lord, this is a reference to, to God, right? To, um, we see this in other places, like the angel of the Lord appeared to Joshua. Every time the angel of the Lord appears, it's to, to bring aid, to help someone out, to bring, to bring God's um, aid and help and deliverance to them. But the focus here is on deliverance. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. I, I think it's worth noting here that, that David did something really stupid. I mean, going to Gath was not the brightest idea. He's basically asking for trouble. He's basically putting himself in checkmate and expecting to get out okay. And David realizes this. He realizes he's not in a good place. But God still delivered him. And it, it's worth noting that, that God's protection is big enough for your mistakes. God's protection was big enough to, to deliver David even when he made a bad choice. Right? So, yes, a lot of times it's easier for us to realize that yeah, God's powerful. He can protect me from the mistakes of others. God can protect me from all the bad people in the world. But it's harder for us to realize, you know, God can protect me from me. God can protect me from my mistakes. When, when I have messed up, when I've screwed up, when I've done something really bad, then God can still deliver me from that. That's what he did for David here. And that's what he can do in your life. There's nothing we can do that, that's outside of God's control. Like, God's sovereignty is big enough for your mistakes. Y your mistakes aren't bigger than God. And even when we've done something completely stupid, completely wrong, when, when we... Uh, I don't think David exactly prayed for direction before going to Gath. This was a decision he made in his own strength. But even when, even when we, when we mess up, when we make a mistake, when we do something that's not wise, that's not smart, that's not what God would want, God still has the power to deliver us 
from that. God, God is bigger than your mistakes. Look in um, verses 8 to 10. David's still here talking about his experience. He says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So what does this mean? What, is, what does it mean to taste and see that the Lord is good? Well, tasting with our mouth and, and seeing with our eyes, this is talking about our senses, right? So it, tasting and seeing, this is an experiential knowledge of God's goodness. It's something we can experience with our, our senses. I like what Warren Wiersbe says about this word, about taste. He says, taste doesn't suggest a sip or a nibble. Rather, it implies feeding on the Lord through his word and experiencing all he has for us. So are, are you tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? Look at verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Do we believe this? Do we believe that those who seek the Lord won't have lack? Do we believe that, that okay, if we seek the Lord, if we make him the priority in our life, then he'll take care of us? Jesus made this pretty clear in, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Is this our primary focus? Is it on seeking the Lord? Or maybe it's on getting everything we want out of life. If, if our focus is on getting our desires fulfilled, if our focus is on you know, providing for ourselves, making sure we're secure, we're protected, we're comfortable, if this is our focus, then we're missing it. If, if our focus is on seeking the Lord, then we don't have to worry. We'll have these things provided for us. I love the words to the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. The, the chorus says, All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Do we believe this? Do we believe that God provides all we need? That if we trust in him, we won't lack. We won't have things that we need that we go without because God knows what we need. So that's David's teaching, or, or that's David's personal experience, rather. The rest of the psalm covers David's teaching. So in verses 11 to 17, we'll look at the Lord's protection and the Lord's punishment. They're, they're inter, interwoven throughout these verses, but David here, he shifts from from telling about his experience to teaching others. In verse 11, he says, Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David is teaching here. Verse 12, What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. So first, we see in these verses God's protection, right? God protected David. He was in a rough spot. It, it didn't look like he was going to make it out okay, but God protected him. And according to these verses, it was because... David was righteous. David was seeking God. And we see here a pattern that if, if you fear the Lord, live righteously, speak, speak truth, turn away from evil, seek peace, then the Lord will hear you. His eyes will be on you. It says the righteous cry for help, and the Lord hears. This is what David did. He cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and delivered him. And so David makes an application here. He says, okay, I'm going to teach you. You be righteous. You call on the Lord, and he will hear you as well. This isn't just something for David. This isn't just, oh, God, God's, um, 
God is showing favoritism toward David, and he's really close with David. And sure, God will deliver David, but like that doesn't really matter for you. No, that's not what David says. He moves from his personal experience to teaching, and he says, okay, yeah, I called on the Lord, and he delivered me. So you call on the Lord, and he will deliver you. And then we see also in these verses, it's not just about protection or deliverance. It's also about punishment. We see that the face of the Lord, verse 16, is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. I don't know about you, but it sounds kind of scary to me. Like, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So if I do evil, God is against me. I think it's important to notice that these are these are general principles David's talking about here. It's It's more than just a simple formula, okay? I'm not saying, and David's not saying, oh, just do good and nothing bad will ever happen to you. That's That wasn't true in David's life. That's not true in any of our lives. It's not a simple formula where we can just um, follow a set of rules and our life will be perfect. But the general principle is true. If you do good, you will be blessed. If you honor God, he will bless you. Righteousness pays off. Seeking the Lord is worth it. And also it's true that that if you're not seeking the Lord, don't expect his favor. Don't expect blessings from God if you're not seeking God, if you're not walking in fellowship with God, if you're not living according to God's word. The way to to have a life of blessing is to do what God says. And, and, And I'm not saying, again, this is not a simple formula. It's not that, okay, if I just do this and this and this, God will be pleased with me. No, that that's that's legalism. That's um God is not obligated to give you anything based on what you do. But the fact is that that living a righteous life has benefits. And that's what David is saying here. Walking with God um walking with God has has its perks. And in David's life, he saw this very clearly. He was walking with God. He called on God. He sought God to deliver him, and God delivered him. If David wasn't seeking God, would this have happened? Would he have got out alive? We don't know. But this text makes it clear that that God is is for the righteous, and he's against them that do evil. So the application here is pretty simple. Do righteous. We see it in the last section of the psalm. The Lord's deliverance. Verse 18 says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. I like what Wearsby says about this verse too. He says, God is near, he's near us when our hearts are broken and our spirits are crushed, whether we feel like it or not. This is not a promise with conditions attached. It is a fact. The Lord's near unto them that are of a broken spirit, to the afflicted and brokenhearted. God's near. And this should be a comfort to all of us, because a lot of times, it doesn't feel like God is near. A lot of times, it says the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Maybe you've thought before, wow, it really feels right now like the face of the Lord is against me. But the promise in this verse is applicable here. The Lord's nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. Save it such as be of a contrite spirit. So even even if you might not feel God's presence, the promise is still here. Are you humbling yourself, seeking him, having a broken heart, a contrite spirit? And then we see that the Lord delivers the righteous. Verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. So we know this has has several references, what what David's talking about here. First, he's talking about himself, right? So David had afflictions. He was in a hard place. The Lord delivered him. He kept David safe. He, in a sense, kept all of his bones. None of them were broken. And we also know that this is talking about Jesus, right? We, We see this text 
cited in the New Testament talking about Jesus' death on the cross and Jesus fulfilled prophecy. He was crucified without having any of his bones broken. Which, when you think about it, when you think about how the Romans would crucify people, this is really a miracle that Jesus fulfilled this prophecy, that none of his bones were broken. And it's also true for us, too. So, no, this text isn't saying you'll never break a bone if you're righteous, right? Like, plenty of godly people have broken plenty of bones. But the truth is still here that, that if you're righteous, the Lord is looking out for you. The Lord will deliver you from harm, from adversity, from afflictions. Now, does God prevent everything bad from happening to us? Of course not. Of course not. Again, many righteous people have broken many bones. Bad things happen to good people, and bad things happen to bad people. It's just the way of life. God doesn't prevent um, any... God doesn't prevent every bad thing from happening to us, and many bad things do happen to each one of us. We can see this even, even from the example of Job. So, if you look at as exclusively at this psalm, you might come away with the idea that if we're suffering, doesn't that mean that we haven't been righteous? That, okay, if, if the righteous cry, the Lord delivereth them out of all their troubles, well, if I have troubles, that means I'm not righteous, right? But that's not what the whole of scriptures teach. And we can, we can see that easily just by looking at the example of Job. Right? So Job was righteous. That's what the Bible says. Job was a blameless and upright man. He was righteous, but he suffered greatly. Job lost his kids, all of his possessions, basically everything he had, his own physical well-being. Job lost it all. He suffered. He was righteous, but God saw fit to bring afflictions into his life. So how does this square with the verse that says, okay, right here, verse 19, the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Well, first it, it says, <laughs> I think it's it, it's pretty obvious, the Lord doesn't keep all afflictions out of our lives. It doesn't say the Lord keeps the righteous from having any afflictions. It says many are the afflictions of the righteous. They're going to have them. We're going to have hard times. We're going to have afflictions in our lives. But ultimately, the Lord delivereth him out of them. So, nothing comes into our life apart from God's hand, right? And we, we know from the New Testament that, that God doesn't allow anything to come into our lives, that he doesn't also give us the strength to handle. God's strength is sufficient for our suffering. And nothing, nothing can come into our lives apart from God's hand, apart from God, what God wants. Look lastly at verses 21 to 22. The Bible says, Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. So, none of those who trust in God will, will be desolate. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. And I, I talked about this in one of my other videos. God is our refuge. We can, we can take comfort. We can, take, we can have confidence in this fact that, that God's looking out for us. And our focus doesn't have to be on all the scary things around us. Our focus doesn't even have to be on our own mistakes because we're going to make them. We're going to mess up. And God is bigger than that. Our focus should be on God and on seeking him, on, on pursuing him, on being righteous, on doing what he says. So my conclusion and application to this, this message is pretty simple. Three points. First of all, God is a good God. Second, we should live for him. And third, we can trust in him. I've been encouraged a lot from these truths this semester, and I hope you have as well. I hope this has been an encouragement to you, and I hope we all 
learn to seek God together through no matter what comes into our life, whether it's COVID or being super busy with everything in our lives or the loss of a loved one, or whether it's our own mistakes, whether it's something we should have done that we didn't, whether it's something that we did that really wasn't a good idea. I pray that we're all able to trust God through everything in life and look to him for deliverance, no matter what comes into our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. I pray for everyone who's listening to this video, for everyone at Freedom Back Home. Father, be with them. I pray that you will deliver them out of any afflictions, out of any challenges and trials in life they might be going through right now. I don't know the circumstances in, in each life. Um, Father, I know the circumstances in my life, and I know that I need your strength. I need your deliverance. I'm sure we could all say the same. Father, I pray that we'll, we'll keep our eyes on you. I pray that we'll seek you. I pray that we would live righteously and put our trust in you. Father, help us to do this all by Jesus' name and for his glory. And in his name I pray.